Always good to be here and to meet all of you, and thank you, first of all, for all your support. Uh, I'm full-time in India, 18 years, been going there 20 years, so about 20 years of our life has been over in India, and you've been behind me every step of the way, and I appreciate it. And I have a lot of slides, so I don't want to talk much, but get into the slides and let them uh, show you. I'm trying to do a little bit of an overview of the work from the beginning of the work at the first orphan home in 2007 and try to bring us up to the day. But uh, I had 42,000 pictures when I started looking for these slides. So, you know, uh, you don't have 42,000 pictures today. I know everybody be exiting, I can see. <laughs> okay. So we'll go quickly and go through it. And again, if you have a question, something, raise your hand. And I'll stop, try to stop and answer. And hopefully maybe we'll have a few minutes at the end that I can answer any questions you might have. Side but oh, well, I don't see the red no more, right? Okay. Okay. Uh, first of all, I always say thank you. Uh, and these slides talk about all that you've done for me and so many things that we can't even mention here, but your generous support and all the things that we've done. We have spent a lot of funds in India to build a, a large school and two orphan homes and big medical clinics and the many medical camps and the disaster relief works that we've done and earthquakes and flood zones and things like that over the years. You've always been involved in all these good works and very much a part of everything we do. And those who have adopted uh, uh, children and helped support these children over the year, many of you have done that. And I appreciate that so, so much. We're reaching the point now that I don't really adopt a child back out anymore, uh, but we do need funds sometimes to help a poor child. 60% of my kids cannot pay full tuition. 20% can pay nothing. And so I try to bring funds in to help these kids come to school. It's very hard for me to say no when a parent comes in who's very poor and wants their kid to have an education. I'm the only hope they have. And my principal, they, they try to hide me from parents walking up because they, they know if the parents come to me and ask for a discount, I'm automatically going to discount them. Or if it's bad enough, I'll say, hey, let me have your children and we'll, we'll train them. So uh, it's, uh, it's hard. And of course, I appreciate all you do there. Let me back up a slide here. But I want to begin with the beginning. When I first began to go to India, and I always had the idea that I wanted an orphan home with the schools of preaching and other things that we've done. Uh, I uh, used this scripture that talked about this faith as a mustard seed. And I've seen um, this, this mature over the years, and that truly God is right here, that if we have faith as a mustard seed, as, as working together, we can accomplish great things for God, and you may help make that possible. Uh, let me do an overview with you best I can with the number amount of time that I have. But people say, well, why India? Let me show you some slides of the many gods. If I showed you all the gods, they estimate 325 million gods. We would be here for about a year <laughs> okay. just looking at pictures of their gods. But these are a couple of the temples, one a very magnificent temple on the left that goes back hundreds of years. One on the right is uh, a sort of a modern temple that's in Guwahati. Uh, right across from the hotel I usually stay in when I fly into Guwahati for a day or two. Here's some of the pictures of their gods. Their gods are anything and you want them to be. And they come from hundreds of years of cultural history and merging of the Davidian tribes with the other Aryan tribes that came together and formed India. And so just many of them. Uh, you can see the facial shapes like Humanan, that's the monkey god on the right side there, and Krishna one of the major gods that people worship on the left side, a god of blessings. There are just many, many gods. Uh, the elephant god in the bottom left, if you own, own a business, you'll have that god picture or his icon or a little statue of him in your business to guarantee you'll have a good business. It doesn't always work that way. <laughs> okay. But they have every god you can imagine, and they can make up any god they want. Uh, some of them have no god. Atheism is a type of worship among a lot of Hindus. They say, well, I'm an atheist. I don't believe in a God, but I'm a Hindu. So they can just merge all that together. It's very hard to deal with that when you're trying to talk to them about Christ. And the sermons I present is the one true living God. You know, how we only have but one God. Those are major sermons that we preach to the Hindus when we have opportunity to preach or to study with them. But this is our first orphans in 2008. I had 16 come at one time, all from Gandhi Gram, right on the Chinese border. And they all look Chinese, right? And they're from the Lisu tribe. And I still have many Yobans. If you have a child with a last name Yoban, uh, they're Lisu. And they originated from China, migrated through uh, Burma, then came into India maybe 100 years ago now. And these kids come from that origin. They are true Indian citizens. 
uh, of course, now in our country. But every one of these children, you look at them, uh, I mean, I know them all. Most all of them there are gone. I have four of these sitting here in college right now. They will be teachers for us in our school in another couple of years. And just some pictures of our first beginning called the Mustard Seed Village. We began this in 2007, built it, and began to bring the kids in in 2008. And getting all these children here. Uh, the far left one in green, she's in college. The little girl up front, Rasha, uh, she's in college. Right behind her is Bolingi. Uh, she's in college. And the other ones are married or have matured out and uh, moved on somewhere else. Okay. These are some of my first little group of orphans. They're just like stair steps. And you may have seen this picture 10, 15 years ago. Okay. And Gentina on my left, she's heading to college in about three months. She's a very bright student. Uh, and all these kids uh, are all grown now. And four of them have moved on in their life to other education or whatever they can do with their life. Just, just some pictures of uh, me meeting with the boys there at the old Mustard Seed Village. Uh, there's a Rocky on the left and Rasha on the right. Uh, Rasha's in college. Rocky is preparing to go to college. And they're just beautiful children that's grown up uh, with your care and my care, learned about Christ, baptized into Christ, now good, strong Christians who will make a difference for the work in India. Always going and, of course, gathering children over the years. Someone would call me and say, we have a child that has no one. Can you come and get the child? And I would go and try to get this child. This is Binu I'm holding now. Now she's 17. Okay. And on, uh, on the right, uh, I, I'm holding two little girls, a little girl and her brother, uh, that the Gumbroy, we call him a mayor, but he has absolute power in his village, even power of life and death. Uh, called me and said, look, we have two little children running over the village. The mothers ran off to some guy in Bihar. The fathers are drunkard and can't take care of them. Can you please come and get these kids? And so that's where I'm at, picking up these two little children. And both of these children are now uh, grown, and both of them have jobs and are working. Here's uh, where I went to pick up a group of orphans. This is a lawyer that's trying to bring them to me to the line of the border. And she really worked hard for her to get these children to me, but when I got there, the government stopped me. They don't like the idea of children going to a Christian orphan, orphanage, and uh, they just said, you know, can't have them. So it's sad that I had to leave these children behind. I could have really helped them. You know, this is our very first school. So you can see we had a very modern <laughs> school at, at the beginning, just bamboo with cement floors. Eventually it started out with dirt floors, and we cemented the floors. But that school went through preschool through about class six. And we ran that school for a couple of years until we began to build in another location because of government interference. Uh, but all the kids here, these are boys probably getting ready for exercise uh, out there. And here's a picture taken from one of the water towers showing basically the village. You see how simple we built it. Again, built out of bamboo with tin roof, uh, six cottages that held three for girls, three for boys. And then you see the school in the far left background and the far right is the kitchen, dining hall, and worship facility. And behind that, we have a little baptistry there for baptism. And so everything was simple. We just tried to keep things simple. Each one of the colleges were named after different congregations, uh, those who helped me build those congregations. Pictures of our kids in their classrooms. Just, you know, we built the little tables and chairs they sat in. And again, all these children are now grown and, and, and going on in their lives. Uh, some more pictures of them taking tests and so forth. And a uh, little one on the left, uh, Afu is his name, holding that little Bible. Afu is 18 years old now, works for me as a carpenter. Okay. Uh, the ones on the right are being punished. I showed this picture probably to you, I don't know, 10, 12 years ago, but they make them get on their knees, pull on their ears, and stay there. You know, I imagine they get very long earlobes after a while, <laughs> and that was a way of punishing them if the teacher had a problem with them. And the one on the left works for me also for about five years, and he works for me. He's one of my drivers, drives one of my buses. Okay. He's smart. He's got his knees on, on his flip-flops, so it doesn't hurt as much. Uh, some of the girls are swinging there uh, at, at the old mustard seed village. The boys love to bathe in the creek that we had behind the house. I wouldn't get in. There's so many snakes. and No, it's not an alligator, but it's not called an alligator, but it has teeth. And I said, if you want to go swimming, go ahead, but I'll just watch you. you know. uh, typical food that they get is always rice, sometimes a little chicken and whatever vegetables that we're able to buy in the market, in this case, watermelon, that they eat every day. Exercise is something we do every morning at 4 a.m. Uh, that's still our policy today. Everyone's up at, I'm up at 3, we're up at 3.30. Bell rings for everyone. 
4, 4 a.m., everyone's out for exercise. And we've always done that. It brings them together, keeps them healthy, and it puts them in a routine. It's very, very important. Uh, here we are having one of our, we have, we've had three sister days, a ladies day, and this is one of our first ones. I see my wife in there. She's one of our speakers there that day. And so uh, that's not a very clear picture. And here's Cindy's where this girl interpreted for her. She was one of my preacher's wives, and she interpreted for Cindy when, when she was there. I guess it's probably been, what, 10 years since Cindy's been able to go. It's just too dangerous for her to travel over there, and I, I would be afraid to take her. And there's um, three of the kids taking a bath. This is our, our vegetable market. In the old MSV, we had no way. We didn't have much room for gardens, so we had to buy vegetables. And, you know, you just had a very limited choice what vegetables you could buy to go over the rice, whatever they were selling in the market, uh, which is once a week, sometimes twice a week. Baptism, this is a small Baptist we, we, we built. And many of our kids, as they matured, were baptized. But not only that, many people in the villages, we would bring them there for study and baptizing. Kids were always interested in watching what's going on here. And eventually they will learn, and eventually they too, hopefully, will be in that water or some water becoming Christians. Evangelism, uh, we do all over. Many different village evangelism, which is one of my favorite things to do, is to get out into the small villages in the Chalkmaw region or the Carby region and hold village evangelism. And I'm usually doing a medical camp at the same time because good works opens doors. And we found that to be very true. But some of my work among the Chalkmaw, and this is our study going on. These are preaching students, and we're just studying, actively preparing to go out and do an evangelism at a, a larger neighborhood maybe 50 miles away the following week. Uh, they're receiving the diploma from the Antioch Institute, which was a Bible school program open to anyone who wanted to study the Bible. And that was an excellent, excellent program. Another group, this is way over in West Bengal, uh, also in that congregation, which is in a large tea garden, uh, receiving their diplomas after their uh, graduating. There's many baptisms, of course. That's why we're over there is to bring people to Christ. Many people here, uh, and a lot obey, but we know that it's the few that truly will hear and, and truly obey the Word of God. But just many pictures we have of people being converted, hundreds of them. I found as I went through the pictures, but let me just sharing a few of them with you. Uh, the one on the bottom right there, I just baptized those two about six months ago. He's now my rainbow overseer with his wife, who is my cook, but she's pregnant. Very hard to meet a woman over there that's not getting ready to have a baby, having a baby, <laughs> and so forth. It's one of the problems of his birth control in India. Uh, here's some baptism. This old man was brought to me and had nowhere to put him, so I brought him in and trained him. Over about a year later, uh, he was baptized into Christ. And just, just many pictures of, of, of baptism. We do a lot of medical work, and we do earthquake uh, work, uh, what we call disaster relief. There's a major disaster. Now my hands are tied by the government. I'm, if I'm, when I go to my work, the government says, you go to your school, we will check every day to make sure you're there. You don't go to the villages. You don't go anywhere else. So my hands have been tied for the last three years. Now, I can leave Arunachal and go to any other state in India and do what I want to do. But in Arunachal, I'm really clamped down upon. But uh, this was in Nepal, 2015, I believe, when that major earthquake. I've been two earthquakes in Nepal. Uh, but this was a massive earthquake uh, that we went, went to the Epic Center. It took four days to walk to the Epic Center once we got to Kathmandu and then did a, a disaster relief. Here we are walking in that direction, and uh, just, uh, you know, many, many deaths. We were some of the first ones to reach the epic center point, the high in the mountain there, and just many deaths. And then after the earthquake, the rains came, and then you had many massive mudslides because of the earthquake, and many people were buried in the mud uh, there. So uh, then we do a lot of medical missions just when there's, like, flood zone, a lot of flood. We're on the Brahmaputra River, a major river that flows from China all the way through our land and then uh, goes on. And here you see we're doing a flood relief. We're handing out blankets and pillows and uh, bedding and food supplies, Bibles, things of that nature. Uh, just, I guess about this time last year, I spent a, some time in a leopard colony, uh, working with the leopards and so forth. And here's some pictures of the leopard colony. Try and think of the brother's name on the left. Matt, do you know his name? Uh, he graduated at Free... Who? Yeah, Ricky Goodham. You got Ricky Goodham. Graduated from Free Hardeman University. So did his two brothers. His father is considered the very first Christ, uh, convert to the church in 1964 by J.C. Bailey in Chennai. And uh, he's still living. 
but, uh, yeah, but anyway, Ricky, uh, we worked here in this leopard colony uh, among these leopards for a while, helping to address you know, their, their problems going on with their body. This man needed a new leg, so we got a new leg for him, had it brought over, and uh, Ricky presented it to him, sent me a picture of it. But leprosy is a major problem. It's called Hansen's disease, uh, really, but it's, it's a major problem in India. There's this regular medical clinics. You go to a village, and usually if they have a little schoolhouse, you'll use a schoolhouse for your medical, set up a couple of sheets for privacy, and then you just treat people all day long. Whatever they come in the door with, whatever you can do to help them, uh, you try to do that. And so just, just, just many of these medical camps. And one, one thing you notice, and it's in this country too, is so much poverty. You know, Here, poverty is usually caused by drug addiction and things of that nature. There, it's just, it's just poverty and particularly in the large cities on the streets. There are tens of thousands of people who just live on the streets and die on those streets. So millions of God's children needs help. Some pictures of, of kids. This is in Calcutta, which I've done a good bit of work in that large city. Uh, people, you know, who live and sleep on the sidewalks, uh, the poverty of the people who live there. Uh, I took this picture laying on the street there in uh, Calcutta. This boy who lost his legs, probably the only friend he has is that, is that little dog. Uh, these are pictures in Calcutta. This little big uh, culvert there, that's someone's home. They live inside that culvert. <laughs> okay. And you can't imagine the poverty that's there and what we can do sometimes to help them. You know, we probably can't move them out of that culvert, but we can help feed them and clothe them the best way we can. Yeah. And then we have congregations that we work with. These little buildings, uh, the one on the left we built, I can build that building for under $1,500. We'll build a bamboo building with a tin roof. We built three or four of these little church buildings. And this is one in Carbon Long on the left. And this is one we just threw up, and it's, it's the church now. Now they've made it a little bit better. And this is in Assam on the right. Midwife is a big thing. I have a midwife clinic where I work. I have a midwife training school where I bring women in and train them in midwifery. And uh, it's a big deal because, as you know, and you make birthing kits for me, and right now we have 24 crates sitting in Calcutta. Been there for four months and I'm trying to get them out. I have a lawyer that's probably there as I'm speaking right now, and I think they'll be released and come back. And there's three crates of birthing kits, about 1,500 birthing kits, which will be very, very helpful to us. But here we see the, you know, just pictures of, of the birth of the children using our kits and so forth to help that process. Uh, here's a, I went to this woman's home, and we helped deliver her baby. Before, you know, when we got there, they had to cook a meal for us. No, they're just cooking something, rice and something over a pot. And this is in a traditional uh, Lisu house uh, that we're in at this time. And this is our uh, midwife training program that we do at Old Rainbow, but now we do it at the New Rainbow Village. We bring them in and train them for three months, and they stay with us, and we take them through and show them how to use all the tools they need to help a woman have her baby in a proper way, and then show them how to use our kit and try to train them the best we can. It makes a difference. Again, India leads the world and babies dying at birth and mothers dying at birth, mainly because of the uncleanness of the whole birthing process. So that's what we're trying to change. Uh, these are two of the women receiving birthing kits. This is up in Vijayanagar, right on the Chinese border. And we send many kits all up into that area. This, this is a little woman, I helped her have her baby. And a month later, I helped her bury that baby. It's always sort of sad. I don't know why that baby died. She had lost two other babies before that. And you see her holding that dead baby, trying to nurse that baby. The baby's dead and it took a while to get her to release that baby, put her in a little cardboard box. She's in the uh, kit, that is in the birthing kit, the little outfit that we put on them. That's what she's being buried in. I named her Joanna. And now she's being buried there uh, in the tea garden. Uh, primitive camps, this is, could be in Bihar, I think this is up maybe in northern Nepal right here. But a uh, little church has been there a long time, okay, and here we are helping them with their birthing. And uh, in, in medical relief, you may be on, on a boat for a long way to get off in a flood zone area to where you need, where you can actually find land to do a relief work. And many damages caused by the massive floodings uh, that happens in the subcontinent of India. Uh, a lot of walking. <laughs> You know, so you have to really like walking and hiking in jungles, but it's a good thing uh, and to get to the places that you need to get to sometimes to do your clinics. 
And I got, here I'm going in one village, all the kids are always interested in a stranger walking into their village, and particularly if they're white or foreign, you know, and I may have been the first foreigner they'd ever seen in this little village on top of this mountain. So they're just fascinated by, who is this guy? You know? And here we are preparing to do a medical camp. I always began with a little bit of preaching, and then I turn it over to my preachers to work with them as I do the medical camp uh, during the day. Doing relief work here and giving out blankets and things to these these families who have lost everything in the floods, and uh, treating you know the patients as they come to me. Remember, I have to have translation with every patient. I just can't talk directly with them. How good it would be if I could communicate with them, but I have to have a translator with me. Uh, doing a Bible study here in, in the same village, uh, there in someone's house that's there outside there, and uh, you know, and uh, just you know we hope to teach and preach and of course bring them to Christ. This is one of my little girls here that, my older girls, I'll sometimes try to train them to help me medically a little bit when I do the medical camp so they can do blood pressure, things like that. It speeds the process up. Just many pictures here. Now we're moving to Mustard Seed Village, and I'm in the year 2013 now, so we've moved to our, our newer area that we, we have this, this now. And this is Mustard Seed Village for the boys. We used to call them Jacob's Hostel. You might remember that, but I've changed it back to Mustard Seed Village because I want to keep that name there. When I leave that work, I want Mustard Seed Village to be a part of it. So we've changed our names to Mustard Seed Village for boys. And this is uh, the, the hostel that they live in. It holds 100 boys. Actually, I need to build another one. That's the funds I'm trying to raise now and build another one just like this so I can hold another 100 boys. And I just almost finished the one for the girls. And when I finish the one for the girls, I'll be able to have 200 girls and 200 boys. That should help fully fund that work from Indian money. And that's the goal of the work. There's some of the boys uh, in their beds, and have their hair cut. My whoever's the older boy cuts the younger boy's hair. I think my older brother did that time or two to me, but against my will. <laughs> Here we are killing a pig and cleaning it. And, uh, they they use, a, use a torch in this case to burn the hair off that pig rather than boiling it and scraping the hair off like we usually do. And then we cook the pork, and this was just done back in October. And then we'll share the meat together. Bible class going on and a devotional going on every night that we have them. Uh, this is at the boys and at the girls as well. Here they're get, having their, their meal. And again, I'm always amazed how much rice these people eat. I just cannot imagine. I mean, that, that plate there would probably feed me for a week. Now, I'm on a pretty strict diet. I, eat, I, eat, I try to eat one meal a day. I pretty well eat only protein, little calories, but nothing more. But anyway, the new dining hall that we just put up last year and so forth. Rainbow Village, uh, this is when we began to build it. And we started building this in 2012, and you can see it coming together. Uh, everything's built out of wood. Okay? And it's built, a lot of it's built out of teak. Teak grows everywhere in the jungles there. And it makes such a difference. And you see the wood coming together. And here we are beginning to finish it. And this is a surround porch. It goes all the way around the Rainbow Village that holds the 100 girls, plus four cottages. One of them is a cottage that I stay in uh, when I'm there. And here's a picture of the Rainbow Village after it's completed and so forth. Some of the pictures of the girls in 2012. Uh, Rocky is on the right. She's now 16 or 17, I guess, of age. Some pictures of them. A lot of the women here made me clothing for these kids. I don't know whether you sisters here made these or not. These dresses were made in America. And then we have them uh, and, and so forth. Some pictures of the girls. They love getting a present or something. And you can see the Bibles and the little dolls that many of them hold. This is our first little church building we built when we moved up to Arenacha. And you can see by our first or second day, we have some Americans there with us. I, I can see from the North City. And, but we feel the building the very first day, of course, and that's without any of our kids being there. And so we need to quickly expand our building. Uh, some of our blind children being taken shopping, able to feel for their clothes, and it's just really a good thing for them to do. The girls always have their chores. The boys do, too. We believe in chores for everyone every day, and you rotate in your chores. There's not a day go by that a child doesn't have a chore to do. It's just something, teaching responsibility. It's very, very important for us. 
They love playing games. They, badminton's a big one. We don't have a, a badminton net. It doesn't last long for some reason. So they, we just, they, they play badminton and so forth. Here's study hall. I'm not sure how much study is going on, but I'm taking a picture, okay? But uh, we have study hall every night, two hours of study hall. They're in school seven hours a day. They come home, have one hour of playtime or bath time or wash their clothes time, and then it's time for uh, their evening meal, then devotional, and then two hours of study hall and then 30 minutes to get ready for bed. So their day is totally regimented, which when you're dealing with about 250 kids in the hostel right now, that's a good program. <laughs> so here our girls are picking our tea. We have a pretty large tea garden, runs around Rainbow Village, that helps us bring in some money. But we pluck our own tea, and the price of tea goes up and down, and so forth. And uh, here's our, some of our girls and boys working in the garden. And one on the left, these two work full time for me. Tiyoshi with a little hat on. He grew up with me. He was five years old when I got him. Now he's married with two children, works for me uh, in the garden, and a very smart young man. And the other one's Matthew, who we baptized, and he's money poor, and he's overseeing Rainbow Village. Most of the girls on the right, uh, about five of these girls are now in college, so they're not there to work in my garden, which I think they're very relieved about. <laughs> Whatever. Uh, our gardens are doing great this year. We had two bad years the last two years because of floods. But this year has been a good year for gardening. Right now we're planting okra uh, this past week and corn. Uh, this type of garden we can plant year-round. There's not a real bad cold season. Right now we, they consider it the winter time. But it will never get lower than 50. In the daytime it will get back up to 80. Okay? So uh, we're able to grow a lot. There's uh, pictures of planting taking place. I'm not sure exactly what they're planting. They're probably some type of beans and so forth. But, you see our beans growing on stalks and the chilies we grow and the mushroom house that we have to grow our mushrooms and so forth. So our gardens are doing great. We're just able to produce our own food, which saves a lot of money, keeps our tuition costs down to help the kids be able to afford it. And so that's a big thing that we're doing. This is a new truck I just bought, I guess, back in October. Now, the other one finally wore out, so we need a truck to move things around and from place to place. And, and they go pick up supplies. It's an old tractor on the left. I really need to replace that tractor, but we, we keep making that one run. We've had it about uh, 15 years, I guess. This is our pig. No, I'm kidding. Now, this is not my pig. I just found this picture. We, we have better pigs than that one. <laughs> These are our pigs, okay? Uh, but we raise enough pigs to feed ourselves, but mainly we sell them off uh, to make a profit on them, and that money goes into the school fund. And so we have about eight pigs right now. And that's enough. Here I am, last time I was there back in October, buying some chickens at the market. And uh, it's just, uh, they're getting very expensive. It's like America. Prices in India, inflation is unreal, uh, what it costs over there. Here's our chickens running around, so forth. And you can buy any type of food you want to eat when you get up there in Meow in the markets. And it changes on what they can dig out of the soil. But I would not be eating these worms, but yes, they eat them. Uh, they eat these larvae. These are in the right brought to me from my honeybee. They took down and, and they want you to eat the little bees. They pluck the wings, not me. And you can have frogs. Actually, there's a snake in there with those frogs. And I'm not sure what type of bugs that is. You know what we're fixing to have here? This is cicada season. And this is going to be a double cicada season for some reason. So I'm worried about what's going to be served <laughs> over the next few months because we have lots of cicadas. Uh, and when they come out. Dog is a big thing over there. You've seen this picture of dogs and how they sell them. And when they cut them up, they look like beef, taste a little bit like beef, more like deer. And, uh, but they eat a lot of dog among the Nagaland. In my area, dogs are delicacy if, if they can afford to buy them and, and to eat them. This is our home school that we started building. Uh, you've seen this picture here. But this is our school being built. We built this 2013, 2014. Uh, you can see it coming together. Uh, you helped me dig a well. Appreciate it. We have two bore wells over 200 feet deep. That's a deep well. We'll never run out of water. Other people have water problems. They'll come to us. You know, the government try to come through. They're finally putting in pipe water, and they'll send you 300 gallons in the morning and 300 gallons in the evening. I said, I don't need your water. <laughs> and I told the guys, I said, you don't want it because they're going to put a meter on it. Sure enough, within six months, every one of them had a meter on their water. So now they have a water bill for the first time in their life. And, but we have, because of you, we can have our own water, whatever we need, abundantly, uh, for, I hope, forever. 
Uh, here's our school. This is a recent picture of the school. You see we built the second floor. They call it the first floor. Uh, but uh, our school, and uh, this was picture was taken, I think, back in October or August or something. And, and all. here they are in the assembly in the morning. All this will move to the multipurpose building, which will be so good because of the rain. And with your great help, we were able to get that built. Uh, give me a sign when I get close to being out of time, okay? Okay. I'm uh, 13 minutes, okay. Uh, it's pictures of our classroom. We've got really good furniture. You know, our school is the best school in the whole area. It really is. No one can compete with us academically, and they can't compete with us with our buildings and, and what we have with our computer rooms, our laboratories, uh, our English immersion program. You can't come into this school unless you can understand, read, write English, and that's difficult. Okay? So we have an English immersion program, and where we talk to the parents and say, look, your kids don't know English well enough, they will fail the class because our teachers are required to teach in English. If they're caught teaching in Hindi, they can lose their job. They can mix some words sometimes and make the meaning clear, but they can't teach fully in Hindi. We want English teaching. That's an education in itself. If these kids are to have a hope outside of India or even within India, they need to be fluent in the English language. So our school is in English and the only one in the area. So people want their kids in our school. So they'll put them in our English immersion. They go a whole year, six, six and a half hours a day, five days a week for a full year, nothing but English, okay? And that sounds pretty boring to me. I don't know if that would have helped my English or not. <laughs> but, but, uh, but at the end of that, they're well off in English, and then they can go into the academic program. But for this year, they get no credits. So it's sometimes hard to convince the parents, let me have your kids for a year. They won't earn any credits, they won't advance a grade, but they'll learn English. But more and more are wanting to do that. Now I need to have two classes of that, probably three classes by next year. So in classes, the library is uh, libraries really growing. We have 4,000 more books sitting in Calcutta that will go into the library, both Bible and, uh, and the academic library. Computer room, I need more computers. And really right now in my visually handicapped room, I'm trying to buy four more computers. And I need Braille com keyboards and I need a program where the words are pronounced back to the blind student when they type, they will hear, so they know how to, they need to learn how to keyboard. That's the only hope they would ever have, maybe of finding employment. And all my blind children are now 16, 17, and 18. Uh, here's some of the children just studying in their house and so forth, in their hostel. Uh, there's some pictures of them. These are the pictures of the kids right now in school. Uh, this is nursery and uh, kindergarten, we, of course, this is their, we have two uniforms. This is their non-dress uniform, but uh, and the one they prefer. Class 1 and Class 2A, we have two sections of Class 2 and Class 3 and 4 and 5. But you need to see the number of children we have and the number of classes that we have. Class 9, we have Class 10. I don't have a picture of Class 10, but that was the last class we added. We won't go any higher in Class 10. Class 10, you, you're through with high school when you get through Class 10. 11, 12 is considered junior college. I like that because once they do that, when they go to college, they just take courses in the degree they want. They don't take all the extra courses that you and I have to have, like art appreciation. Now, I like art, but I'm not sure about art appreciation <laughs> or music appreciation. They don't have to take those unless it's within their area of, of training. Uh, here's a class that's going on. This is a Bible program here. Uh, Roshan is actually doing a competition that we have every month about who knows the Bible the most. These are girls in college right now at, at Namside University. And all of these started out with me, very little girls. Uh, some of them as little as five. Monica on the left, my biggest girl. I think she was 10 when she came to me. She's 20 now. And all of them in college doing very well. Their English is so well uh, in this university, which is a hin Hindu university, uh, and they try to do their work in English. They're asking my students to translate for them. So uh, that's a good thing. Every quarter we give uh, little medals and things out to the children who do best in every Bible class, which they have every day. And it's a big thing. They really compete to get the little Bible diploma and the little Bible medals that we give out. These are some of our kids that were baptized. Well, I think I baptized all of them on that day. They're all between 13, 14, and 15. And uh, uh, the older guy there baptized him. He was my bus driver. He looks pretty tough, but he ended up being a pretty good fellow. 
two of our buses that we run now, I actually could add a third bus, but I'll let them do it after I'm gone if they can build their program to get that done. But we run these buses twice in the morning, twice in the evening, two different locations. So we start out about an hour and a half before school running our bus routes. So uh, we're involved in everything. The government, like here, they want to control every aspect of our education. And uh, I fight them on that. I always tell them I'm a private school, I'm American-based school but sometimes I have to do what they want to do. Like this was just done two weeks ago, uh, uh, where they had, everyone had to come and be involved in uh, no tobacco day, and that's a good thing, okay? But it takes them away from seat learning in school. But, but anyway, some things they have to give in to, but this is no tobacco day. I've showed you this picture I'm gonna show you next, but this guy came to me and uh, he died about two weeks after coming. There ain't nothing you can do about him. You know, he chewed tobacco, a beetle nut or something. It just destroyed them. There's no hope for them, you know. And so I thought, well, that goes good with no tobacco day. I should have put that on a sign for them, for them to walk with. This is our new school building that we're building, uh, not school building, multi-purpose building. It's finished now. You'll see some pictures as we go through it. Thank you so much. That building will hold 500 people easily. Has a full stage, oh, four times as big as this stage. It could hold an entire course. Uh, this is where our preaching and all will come from on Sundays. Now the Meow Road Church of Christ is in this building. And so because of you and others, we've been able to build this building that we started three and a half years ago. This was a 10-month building contract. It took three and a half years from the building. The pandemic really interfered. Then he got throat cancer, which put him out of commission for a while. And, but we finally got it finished about four months ago. I think it finally completed. Here you see the building going up, uh, the inside of the building being finished and outside of it as we put the brick on it, flooring being totally refinished and, and made smooth so we can put flooring down on it. And there's an outside of the building, still some work to do. Here we're putting the Meow Road Church of Christ on the left side so everyone drives down that road and it's the only road in Arenacho, okay? Everyone who comes in the state goes down this road. And so they all see, you know, we, where we worship, who we are. It raises questions and may be helpful to us. Here's the front of the building where we have the Opelous English Medium Christian School signboard, but this faces uh, the campus. And this building's, I don't know how big it is, it's 180, maybe 200 and something feet long and maybe 120 feet wide. It's, it's on the drawing, it's, it's massive. We have eight classrooms in there. When you look in the front of here, on the left side is our Bible department. We'll hold all the Bible library, which is probably approaching 5,000 books. And on the right side, we'll move our other library for the students, which will give me three more classrooms, which I'm going to need to add another 60, 70 students. Five minutes, okay. Here's a building coming together and so forth. Uh, this is the last, last building we're building right now, okay? You may have helped me with this building. I think you did. But this is a new hostel building for the girl. I need to build the same for the boys uh, when I return, and then I think I'll be able to get things done and finished up in a proper way. So here's a new one. This is long, too. This is 128 by 36. It'll hold 100 girls easily, eight bathrooms, lavatories. Everything will be able to fit in this building when we get it finished. So you see it coming together. These are our crates. Thank you so much. Like I say they've been sitting in Calcutta since October 18th. Okay? And they've charged me 5,000 rupees per day. Every day it sits there. Uh, but that's just their way of getting money from me. 5,000 rupees a day is about $45 a day, but they've had them 90 days, so you multiply $45 times 90 days, you see why well, I've had to pay them. Uh, but now I'm hoping to get it released and be sent up uh, the next day or two to our village. Uh, but it has so many things that we need for our library, for our school, uh, for our birthing kits, and things of that nature. And here, here they are in one of these containers here. And my last slide here, I just wanted to let you know our goals for our work here, okay? Uh, you know, I'm hoping that by March 31st of 2025, that will be the end of this coming uh, business year, which ends at the end of March in India. We have to have a meeting and submit all the documents to the government. Then on that day, if everything's ready, I'm, I'm hoping to sign, up, sign the dotted line. My elders have already signed the dotted line. And I wonder if I sign it, I can turn it over to the foundation board. Uh, all of them made up of members of the Meow Road Church of Christ, and they will take over the work. And this will hopefully will go on for decades and decades. And then I'll be able to come home and uh, either do something different. I turned 70 January 6th. I'm a January 6th, but that's because I was born on that day, okay? And uh, 
uh, and I can maybe do something different over here you know, for a while. But to do that, I've got to add another 100 paying students. I've got to complete a, a boys' hostel that I need to raise the funds for, and then I need to make sure that my board is fully Christian and they understand their role, and they're pretty well there. Uh, two on my board, I brought them up since boys, and now they're men. And three of them were baptized years ago, so they're very strong members of the board. But I need to add about three more members on the board and then appoint a president to oversee things. And then uh, I'm concerned about the Indian government. Right now, we're, they're very hostile to any Christian work. Uh, they could seize my work. I don't think they will. Uh, they would have much problems from the people who send their kids to my school if they try to disrupt that school. So I don't think it's going to happen. And then, of course, God's will will happen in all things. We have to just sometimes do all we can and understand that God will take it the rest of the way. Uh, so anyway, I, I appreciate it. Any questions? Time is up. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, my voice is sort of raspy today, so I hope you can hear it. <laughs>